I can repeat the question. It was really essentially music first or lyrics first, and all the early stuff all that we were talking about, Hallelujah or whatever, I'd string together these amazing long chord progressions or something like that it was raining, and then I'd sit down for you know eight months sometimes drafting the lyric to get it fit. Because at eventually at the end of the day, no matter which way you go about it, they have to sound absolutely that text and that music could not be with anything else. It just has to sound like it, almost like it's all coming out at once, um, which it never does. It's, you know. And basically, I mean, I wrote some eight minute, you know, with, with all these wonderful chord progressions and modulations and all, you know, really exciting stuff and dragged them around for five or six years. Can you ever find a word for it? Can you ever find a scenario that would work as a text? It seemed like it needed a text. But you can, well, I've forgotten them now. So seven years ago, I just kind of made a decision that, um, well, let's let's try it, you know, because this is how Schumann can write, or Schubert can write 200 songs in a year, right? If he's got text, he doesn't have to write them. So, you know, they just go and find the poets. They find the text and they look at it and go, right, okay. So what I've been through today, I mean, you know, if you're going to you know, do a glacial cold thing, there's tempo, the rate of harmonic movement, how do you, you know, what sort of, lots of bare open, like warm chords, but bare, naked kind of sounds. So you, you, you kind of scan the text and it tells you a lot about tempo, it, 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 some things like the opportunities that I talked about earlier, like the refrain, do something smart, something, something harmonic. <laughs> Seventh chord and third inversion, technically speaking. Yeah, that's smart. Compared with the other stuff, which is quite dumb. You know, like so you, you can see if you've got the text in front of you and you let it tell you what music it wants, where it wants things to change, what you end up with is that marriage, and you end up with it much quicker. Which is why I've been hearing my kids to say, look, you know, try it, just try it for a year. You know? And because output is a virtue all by itself, you know. The students, I can say, look, if you write three songs a year, you don't have a career. Basically, that's the end of the story, you know, especially when you're young, because you know, you put out an album and then, you know, and you put another one out a year later, and the same people that bought the first one will still be in the market. If it's five years between one album and the next, those people have got marriages, kids, and mortgages, and they want to buy records. You kind of. <laughs> You need to get them hooked with two or three great records in a short time span, and then they might keep following you even through the hard times of marriage and kids and mortgages, and, and, and might come back to you. We'll just keep track of, oh, you put, oh, they put another on. Oh, I might treat myself to that, you know? And it's, so yeah, productivity is really, I mean, it's kind of my job actually to tell students, well, you can do it that way, but it can be a black hole of time, and you end up with either no song or a song that's very square peg round hole with the relationship between the lyrics and the music. And all the great songs, it doesn't matter how they were written, they all sound utterly like you can't, you can't imagine this music not being with this text. And it's the whole point of the degree. 
is that we give the students you know, all sorts of skills. You know, they have to be able to read. Okay, you can go and play in your rock band and throw your reading all out. You know, want to use it in the context of your rock band, but by the time you finish your degree, you'll be a very good reader. And you, therefore, you will be able to do film work. You should be able to do you know, a general, you should be able to do this, you should be able to teach kids to do stuff, you know. You should be able to go to high school, that's what a degree gives you, you can become a high school teacher, and many of ours are, and they're fantastic. Compared with the music teachers I had, I would like it. And it's just, if I had some of the people that we're producing, you know, you would have died and gone to heaven to have someone like that teaching you in high school. So, yeah, but, but they, they're under no illusions. It's, because it's a small country, four million people. You know, how many times can you tour it before, hang on a minute, you were only here last week. <laughs> when am I going to see you again? That's why people go to America, because you, you go, you know, it takes you a month and a half to do a pretty big circle, and then you take a month off to recuperate, and then you go and do it again. That's how they build profile in America. And so you're coming around about once every three months to each town, and it's 200 people the first time, and then they all tell their mates, and it's, 500 the next time, and then it's 1500. You know, that's how the Nirvana and all those sort of bands that's happened. But we can't do it yet. We're too small. So, yeah, we're stuck with doing something else. Really. And that's just the unfortunate truth of it. Thanks, Frank. I was just really interested in your approach to editing. You know, if you write a poem in February and you're waiting for that January golden holiday period. Yep. So it's been, you know, 11 months. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were writing in February, were you humming an imaginary tune so that your syllables kind of fitted? Or do you do all that reducing? Or what's your process of editing when you come around to January? What I generally do is I write the poem and just, uh, some of them, I mean, I keep them. Every time I change them, I go up uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sometimes up to about 18 or 19. And then when I start setting up the music very quickly, tells me, <coughs> excuse me, I want another line of text here, please. <laughs> Just because the way the music's going, and then you go through all your old drafts and find something that you discarded because you thought you could get away without it, and then you go, oh, actually, I can actually use that now. More often than not, what the music does is eject the text. It's, it's usually appearing now and um, you know, simplifying, getting get rid of any word that you don't, is not necessary to be there. Or if you've got two lines with two strands of meaning, can you find a way to incorporate all of that into one line? Can it be compressed? Uh, and that's, that's the difficulty with working with students, of course. It's, it's, a, it's a real, it's an experience type process. But that's, you know, that's what you have to do. Um, so yeah, that's quite often what happens is, I, I'll get the, the poem there to the point where the meaning is captured. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Meaning capture is the first thing that you do. And I tell students, you know, don't try and write songs, lyrics, don't. Write them in prose first, capture the idea first of what you're going to try and say. Then start maybe versifying it a little bit, just a little bit. And then when you get the music to start, the music will start telling you, ah, this needs to be A, A, B, B, A, A, C, C, or whatever, the rhyme scheme, the music will push it around anyway. So there's no point in being too kind of like focused on it too early. You just kind of get it, okay, it's captured what I wanted to say. Now let's see what we did. Start the music process and the music will cause another edit to happen most times. Um, either for phonetic reasons, oftentimes, because that's the other part. You know, everything about singing is you, you need to have your mouth when you finish saying one word, it needs to be in the right place to start the next one. You know. If you end up at the front of your mouth, the next word's pretty tough to go way at the back. I mean, I, I call call it tongue gymnastics. That's what my students know it as. You know. So there's all, all sorts of things that can get tweaked for all sorts of different reasons. <coughs> yeah. I've got possibly two questions. What, what do you think of Stephen Malcolm's version of Death of the Maiden? And have you had a chance to get to him about songwriting? <laughs> no, no, I, that's pretty much the only time I've met him. I've met him. Stephen Malcolm, when he came over, it was a flying on the 22nd or whatever it was. Um, he was last to recall, I think he had a few too many substances during the day. And, all, and kind of at the end of the day, he said, Oh, I'll do this for the And I said, All right, I'll write the words out for you. And I said, I know the baseline, so I've recorded in 15 minutes, one day. Really. <laughs> we just, just sang it once and we just played along, and that's it. Drummer from what band, I can't remember. That's all right. It's, it's, it's 
got this mannerism thing going on. Um, but you know, um, it seems the bands, you know, LMNOP you know, did it as well, so it seems the bands can do it without wrecking them entirely. So. Which is always a good sign, actually, of a good song if somebody else can sing it. Um, and it's always kind of like a, a real, you know, you probably know that if somebody else can sing it, make it work for them. Hasn't got when he came over, that was the flight on the 22nd or whatever it was. Um, he was last to record, I think he had a few too many substances during the day. And kind of at the end of the day, he says, oh, we did for the And he says, all right, I'll write the words out for you. And he says, I know the baseline, so it was recorded in 15 minutes, one take. Really. <laughs> we just, just sang it once, and we just played along, and that's it. We're drumming from one band, I can't remember. It's all right. It's, it's got his mannerism thing going on. Um, but you know, um, it seems the bands, you know, Alan, you know, Pete did it as well, so it seems the bands can do it without wrecking it entirely. So. Which is always a good sign, actually, of a good song if somebody else can sing it. Um, and it's always kind of like a, a real, you know, you probably know that if somebody else can sing it, make it work for them. Hasn't got the quirk. It's Don Passion calls it, which is it'll work for you, but I'm not for anybody else. Cool. No other questions? One more? It's, uh, yeah, well, I mean, the standard song forms are AAA. Same music, different groups, very different stories. Johnny Mitchell Coyote, half of our PTA. Uh, AABA, with B section of different music with a different perspective. They're usually really, really good for head voice songs when you're actually your eavesdropping on somebody thinking. Yesterday, love was such an easy game, the player's talking to himself. No one else in the room, so it's good. Verse chorus or verse climb chorus. Um, they're good, they're sort of, you know, you set the who, what, where, about what the song is, and you delay it a little bit, and then you've got this grand statement, and this is why I say, because the night belongs to lovers, because the night belongs to us, I've got this big statement to say. Okay, and um, a lot of Dunedin band stuff, flying and stuff kind of doesn't go for that bomb I mean, that's what Death of the Maiden is, actually. But it's kind of handy because the chorus is nonsense. <laughs> when you get there, it's got all the hallmarks of the big punch and chorus, but when you get there, it's sort of dribble. So it's kind of a piss taken away. Um, but yeah, so that, that's it. I mean, and, and various people are right about the art of songwriting lyrics. But one of, and we had a wonderful country singer giving a chat to us down in Dunedin last year. We can't recall his name. He says, You only have to make one mistake to ruin a song. <laughs> He says, because the best ones out there just don't make mistakes. Everything's perfect in them. And one of the things that especially young songwriters can make a mistake of is getting addicted to verse chorus. And they write up a lyric, and uh, this is far too intimate a content to be sort of, you know, from the stadium rock things. You know, it's, you've got the wrong form, and you're trying to stick that text into it. I mean, the thing is, you know, there's a lot of influences in my music, um, which is, you know, there are rock influences, but there's a lot of classical influences, and, um, you know, a lot of like, the early stuff, and it's a deep way of arranging 22 or 24 songs for the Southern Symphonia to sing with Annalise next February, in Dunedin, if you want to go down to Dunedin on February 28th. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's, they're awesome. They're so easy that they just, you know, they, they adapt to an orchestral setting very, very easily. Um, and they sound fantastic. Because they do have a symphonic sweep about it. Um, you know, a lot of the time it's to do, it's to do with the phrase and things that I've talked a little bit about tonight. For the most part, because it's four plus four, very square, because it's predictable. Kids can get it. You can dance to it because you know when you put it in your body. 